Hello, and welcome to the SSC meeting. Uh, Secretary, I'd like to welcome you. I know it's the last day right now, but uh, this is, I guess, one of the first opportunities I've had to, uh, to welcome you. I hope you're enjoying yourself uh, so far. What we're going to do is we're going to diverge a little bit. Why? Uh, because I'm an entomologist and I play with bugs. So we're going to talk about uh, protein semiconductors in relation to insect olfaction. Now, a number of you probably are more familiar with semiconductors than you would be insect olfaction. For that reason, I'm going to go spend a little more time talking about insect olfaction so that you understand where I'm coming from and why I'm going to go in the direction of the semiconductors at the end of the talk. First, how do insects smell? I think everyone knows, I hope everyone knows, that they all smell with their antennae. They smell with their antennae, and this is uh, no more obvious than some of the large moths. Largest moth in the world right here, 11-inch uh, wingspan, uh, Atticus atlas, and uh, they take a look at the antennae here, especially on the Saturniids because they're so big. But it's not really the antenna itself, it's usually the sensilla. So if you get a close-up of the sensilla, you can see on this uh, scanning electron micrograph that they have these long trichoid sensilla, which we know are the detectors. And these are the actual detectors of the molecules that they are smelling, such as the pheromone or the plant odorants. Now, if I go ahead and make a cross-section now of this, you can see that the sensilla is, uh, does have some tiny pores in the side right there. They also have some dendrites emanating from these cells down here, trichogen tor tormogen cell. The dendrites are sent up. They're bathed in a saline solution. And uh, uh, this is the basic setup for most types of insect sensilla. Uh, this is where I'm in agreement with them, and uh, we do not differ at all. Things start to get a little hairy right now. Let me tell you what the current theory is right now so that you're up to date. We have the pheromones out here. The pheromone is in blue. The pheromone diffuses through the air. It lands on the sensilla. This is the sensilla right here, the outside. There is a very, very thin layer of wax. They usually embed in the wax. And when they embed in the wax, they diffuse through the wax, make their way to some tiny pores through it, and then they have to wait. They have to wait because it's a lipid. Uh, water and oil don't mix. This is water. The pheromones are a long chain 14 carbon acetate, and therefore they're not going to diffuse through it. They have to wait for a pheromone binding protein, which is pretty large, in order to come along, grab it from the pore, pull it in. It will then ferry it across the sensilla lymph. It will then make its way to a receptor, and uh, somehow binding is uh, meant to occur, whether it's with the pheromone directly, or whether it's with the pheromone binding protein complex with the pheromone, and this is how detection occurs. You are now up to date, and you can now publish any information on insect olfaction, because this is about as far as we go, you can apply for an NIH grant, NSF grant, and you will get funded for this. <laughs> now, what is the overlying theme right here? Diffusion, diffusion, diffusion. We've got diffusion through the air. We've got diffusion through a wax layer. And I've got now diffusion through the sensilla lymph, even though it has to piggyback on a pheromone binding protein. Well, this makes my job a little bit easier right now, because when you've got a mechanism as singular as diffusion, there are some laws that you can follow, and you think to yourself, wow, this is diffusion. I mean, uh, we can predict this. Sure, it's going to be faster through air, slower through the wax, and a little bit faster through the water, though, but there are some, some generalizations that can be made. And in former talks, I've let you know that diffusion does not account for the ability for the pheromone to reach the receptor in time. If, if the diffusion is all I have to work with, and I assure you that this is all I have to work with, then, according to the current theory, I can't get to that pheromone to the dendrite in time in order to say that the insect is now detecting it. How long does this take? This takes one millisecond. No, it takes a little bit less than one millisecond, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 milliseconds. Now, to you biologists, some of you are impressed right now. You're thinking, Tom, that's fast. But to you physicists, you're like, eh, it's casual. You know, one millisecond, uh, because you guys are dealing with nanoseconds, picoseconds, maybe femtoseconds. We're, but the biologists, I and mean, if we're dealing with less than one millisecond, that is lightning fast for a biological system. So, what to do? Here is our cross-section. I've blown it up a little bit so you can take a close look to see what we're talking about. The pheromone. The pheromone I'm dealing with is about two nanometers long. But the pores are between 10 and 50 nanometers in diameter. What's going to happen? When the pheromone hits the sensilla, it's going to clog the pores. It's going to clog the pores because there's just not that much room. And it's not just the pheromone that gets in. Anything that the insect wants to smell is going to have to get through those pores and get to the dendrite. Anything. Plant odorants, pheromone, you name it. And so everything is going to get clogged because it's not going to diffuse. It has to wait for a ferry boat in order to carry it across. Problem. 
also. So the researchers looked for the proteins because they got the funding for it. Research looked for proteins directly on the dendrite. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we do know that there's got to be something there. The dendrites are, are detecting it somehow. So you take a look at the proteins, and they found some, of course, because there's always proteins on dendrites. But they were not the putative receptors, so they had to keep looking. The research then turned to scanning the genetic codes, saying, all right, we can't find them directly through direct means. Let's do this indirectly. We'll scan the genetic code. We're going to look for G proteins. Why? Why are you going to look for G proteins? Because we know that G proteins are involved in human olfaction. So for UMDs out there, old news for you. For the rest of you, this is new news. So the G proteins are looked at. Lo and behold, they find them. But they don't find them uh, in great quantity. Immunolabeling comes in next. Yes, they find them in the sensilla, but the immunolabeling comes in and they show a very low concentration of these putative receptors. So the question is, where are they? And then the big one, no receptor ligand binding has been demonstrated to date. So as I stand before you, there is no receptor ligand binding. There is no receptor binding. This has not been shown yet. It is assumed. This is also a problem. Why is this? I mean, as a matter of fact, this is a huge problem. Why can't you show binding? In pharmacology, we know that uh, molecules bind to like acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors. This makes sense. But this, we haven't been able to show any binding. So this thing kind of brings me to the theory, which I've talked about before, but let me just review for you. Right now, the current the theory is about lock and key. It's about this binding that I told you about, the receptor, and it's got the pheromone. The lock and key hypothesis of olfaction says we've got the receptor, the pheromone comes along, and it binds with it. And this is what causes the message to make it to the dendrite. The vibrational theory of odor, which some of you know I am a proponent of, does not say that it's a lock and key system. It can operate either by touching the sensilla on the outside if it's acting as an antenna, or it can simply come in close proximity, very close proximity to the antenna, and the antenna or that sensilla will be able to detect it. That's the vibrational theory of odor. I believe that insects are smelling electromagnetically. So let's take a look. But if I'm putting this forward, some of you might be thinking, oh, I, I don't follow. This is new stuff, Tom. I need some help. What's the mechanism? I mean, you've got a message on the outside of the sensilla, and you've got to get it to the inside dendrite. The electrophysiologists tell us that the dendrite depolarizes, a normal depolarization, just like a normal neuron. And a normal neuronal spike passes down the neuron to eventually reach the normal brain. Nothing new about this. So because this is a normal spike, we know the dendrite is somehow involved. If the antenna was the detector, the antenna was the detector, this whole sensilla right here acting as an antenna, then the neurons, which we do know are projecting up, would be unnecessary. We wouldn't need them because the detection is done at the level of the antenna. But we know that there's a message going down the neurons. So if the antenna is simply the primary detector, but not the final detector, then how does a normal spike, and it's very normal, get initiated in the nerve cell? And this is what brings me to the proteins. Ultimately, sooner or later, one must consider that certain proteins on the dendrite are mediating this occurrence in some fashion. But like the Grinch, but how? And so because this is going on, and I do believe that proteins are involved, but I don't believe it's lock and key, we've got to take a look at these proteins. But my problem is that because I'm not dealing with a lock and key, I've got to figure out how to get an electromagnetic message into an electromagnetic message as it passes down the nerve. Now, there is a little bit of, uh, 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 it's not just electromagnetic to electromagnetic. There's going to have to be some, uh, uh, some interplay here. And so this kind of brings me to the point where I think, all right, um, I need a protein, and I need it to react to electromagnetic energy. I'll search the literature, see what I can find. What do I find? Well, the first thing that pops up is probably the most studied is rhodopsin. I'm looking at you right now. You're looking at me. Rhodopsin is firing. It's a great system. What happens? In rhodopsin, which is a protein, by the way, incoming light hits the rhodopsin molecule. Uh, there is a shift in electron density. This shift in electron density causes a conformational change. Can't get much easier than that. It bends. All right? And so this is measured. This is measured because the rhodopsin is there in our eye. It's attached to the cell membrane. Cell membrane has some great electromagnetic properties to it, and it's detected. And it's a beautiful system. And very, very fast, too. However, in order to study a system like this,